Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the A New Era for Gridded Passive Microwave Data at the NASA National Snow and Ice Data Center DAC webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. While everybody's logging in, you do see the two optional polls. Those are located in the lower left and middle portion of the page. And we certainly appreciate your feedback on these polls. I've got 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so we are going to go ahead and get started. All right, great, then I will continue. All right, what I'd like to do first is start off by reviewing a few housekeeping items related to this webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any issues or you have any questions, please enter those into the Q&A pod located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And again, this works like a chat. And thanks to everybody who answered, I appreciate that. This webinar will be recorded and is going to be posted both to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. And I do plan to provide that URL to all of you at the end. All presentation files will also be available for download at the end of the webinar. As far as timing is concerned, this webinar will be one hour long. We've allocated 45 minutes to the presentation and live demonstration with an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. After our speakers finished her presentation, what we'll do then is we'll move to a final set of polling questions, and then from there, we'll transition directly to the Q&A period. Again, you will have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout all portions of the webinar by using the Q&A pod. This works like a chat. Due to the large number of participants, questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. It has been disabled. And just one final note, depending upon the volume of questions that we receive, I will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 Eastern Standard Time for those of you who wish to stay in the line. What I'd like to do now is move to the agenda. During the first 15 minutes or so, our speaker will provide an introduction to NASA's National Snow and Ice Data Center Distributed Active Archive Center, or NSIDC DAC, and their passive microwave data holdings. From there, she will describe the measures, passive microwave, earth science data record, project goals, and objectives. And then we will spend the majority of today's presentation focused on the data product enhancements and how the data have changed with some example images comparing the differences. Finally, we will end with a brief summary. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Mary Jo Brodzik, who is a senior associate scientist at NASA NSIDC DAC. Mary Jo? Jennifer, I am pleased to be here today to tell the audience about our new NASA Measures Gridded Passive Microwave data set. I wish to acknowledge a number of people who have contributed to the success of our project, including my co-I, David Long, who is at Brigham Young University, and his postdoc, Aaron Paget, and my colleagues, Molly Hardman and Richard Armstrong at NSIDC. The information that I'll be sharing with you today also had software development and format contributions from a couple of other people at NSIDC, including Kevin Beam, Julia Collins, Paul Madden, and Matt Savoy. So for those of you who are not familiar with the National Snow and Ice Data Center, we're located at the University of Colorado in Boulder. We are home to one of the NASA Distributed Active Archive Centers, which are tasked with not only distributing NASA data related to the cryosphere, but also providing tools for data access, a user support office, and educational resources about the cryosphere. In addition to the DAC work we do for NASA, we're funded to do cryospheric research by a number of agencies, including NOAA, NSF, and USAID. So just to get a little background on what on Earth are passive microwave data. Uh, passive microwave sensors measure emissions of electromagnetic energy in about the uh, millimeter to meter wavelength uh, range that is emitted from the Earth's surface. And at these wavelengths, clouds are mostly transparent. There are, there are a couple of exceptions in certain frequencies. And emissions are measured both day and night. 
And basically what that means is passive microwave data are very useful uh, for observing phenomena, surface phenomena at high latitudes and during the long polar night. They are useful to derive a number of geophysical data products including sea ice extent and concentration, ocean wind speeds, and other ocean data products, seasonal snow depth and water equivalent, melt onset on the ice sheets, and uh, soil moisture products. So they, they're used for a, a wide variety of geophysical data products. The passive, mi passive microwave data history is really quite long. It begins in 1978. I've, um, and uh, let's see. So I'm just going to skip ahead to this slide. The, the record beginning on the horizontal axis here in 1978 and stretching to when we first wrote our proposal uh, in uh, 2013 is a long record of sensors that are in uh, sun-synchronous orbit. And you can see from this record there was this early sensor that ran for about 10 years, but then in, these, in the middle years here, out to here, there are a number of sensors that were all um, flying sort of in an overlapped pattern. And one of the things that um, we're, one of our goals that we had for this project was actually to, to process all the data that were available. In the past, many, many of these sensors had only been uh, processed for short for periods until a new sensor came online, and then the, the, the previous sensor would be dropped and wouldn't have been processed. So getting back to um, the state of passive microwave data, the historical data uh, that have been available to users is basically a combination of due to funding for, at different agencies from different times and uh, different objectives that we had for the data set at any given time. They were processed differently over different periods. Uh, various projections were used, different gridding techniques were used over time, temporal sampling was done differently depending on a particular data set that was available at that time, and they used a mix of uh, SWAS data, level two source data versions. Whatever might have been available at the time that it was gridded was what was used to actually produce the data product. And then finally, there was a mix of spatial resolutions that was used from 25 kilometers, which was the original sampling resolution of some of the early sensors, to down to two kilometers. But the point that we pushed when we wrote our proposal for this project was that not all data from all the sensors had ever been processed completely in any one consistent way. So there's really kind of this mishmash of data that might be available to users trying to do uh, climate, de climate data record work. They, they, they were really stymied by this, this uh, the state of affairs with what was going on with the data sets. So for our project that has been funded by NASA Measures, we decided that we wanted to take advantage of a couple of new developments that had happened uh, over the past few years, including taking, looking, taking a look at and comparing two SWAT data sets that had recently been released. They're called Fundamental Climate Data Records, um, and they were for those those sensors that you saw on that slide, that timeline slide that, was, that, that showed a lot of the overlapping sensor times. And two new SWAS data records had been released that had done a lot of sensor intercalibration across those, that time period. And we wanted to take a look at it and review it and figure out whether we could actually take advantage of those cross-sensor calibrations. We also wanted to use the improved EaseGrid 2.0 definition. I'll have some details on that in a few in a later slide. And our objective was to use image reconstruction techniques to enhance the spatial resolution of the data. Passive microwave sensors have these great advantages in that they can see through clouds and day and night, as I mentioned earlier. But the disadvantage that they have is that the spatial resolution is generally quite low. Um, on the order of tens of kilometers. And so we wanted to use some image reconstruction techniques to improve that. And uh, I'll have some more details on that later on. We also wanted to process all the data in, the, in that timeline that I showed you earlier. And uh, 
we needed part of the NASA, NASA measures program is to distribute the data from one of the DACs, and our DAC was uh, designated to be the NSIDC DAC. And we do have our uh, initial data sensor, uh, data from AMSER E is currently available from NSIDC. So, and then we will be producing the rest of those sensors on a rolling basis uh, as they become available in the final processing. Another one of the things that made our project a little special in the, in the measures program anyway was that we, we also promised to deliver the software system to the DAC for ongoing processing because there are sensors that are still uh, producing live data and when our project funding runs out, the DAC will continue to be able to use our system to produce the data in the same consistent way. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so I mentioned a minute ago that we have um, a number of input sensors that we're processing. SIMR was one of the first sensors of this type that was launched in 1978. Uh, the input data that we are using from SIMR is the Nimbus 7 SIMR Pathfinder brightness temperatures that are available from NSIDC. Um, we compared those two fundamental climate data records that I mentioned earlier and uh, did a comparison of the intersensor calibrate, the cross-sensor calibration that they did, as well as what geophysical parameters they included in their, in their data sets. I'll talk about that again on the next slide. And then the answer E data, we're also using a level 2A uh, SWAS data set that's available from NSIDC as our input. When we compared those two FCDRs, fundamental climate data records, we basically set up a, a list of requirements that we needed in order to do our processing and to run the system that we had to do. And we compared them. They both produced all the technical details that we needed. And so then we realized that we really had no clear winner for which one we should actually process for our project. And what we did was we enlisted the help of uh, group of volunteer early adopters to basically take a look at the data from both of them. So we processed both of them for a period of about 18 months and we released them to our early adopters to take a look and see if they had any clear preference on, uh, on which data set they preferred. There was no clear preference um, and so we decided to go ahead and use the CSU fundamental climate data record merely because the uh, published record on what had been done to produce those data was a little bit more extensive. But I do emphasize that both of these climate data, these fundamental climate data records uh, would have been uh, sufficient for our processing. And we simply had to choose one because we didn't have the uh, funding to produce data from both of them. So I mentioned earlier about EaseGrid 2.0. And I like to include this slide to show people that um, the original EaseGrid definition that was, that was defined in the early 1990s um, was there weren't any, technically there weren't any problems with it, but over the years as people started using map projection software like GDAL and Proj4 and uh, ArcGIS software, there, it became evident that one of the decisions that we made on the early EaseGrid um, was really causing a problem for those projection, those, those software tools. And this slide is, shows an example of what that issue is. I'm just going to zoom in here so that you can see these areas. This is an area along the coast, uh, the southeast coast of Greenland. The underlying uh, image that you see here is the NASA blue marble. And the orange lines, these sort of squiggly lines that you see along here and up here, were Operation Ice Bridge, NASA Operation Ice Bridge flight lines for flights that were deliberately intended to actually fly off the coast of Greenland in the blue area that, that looks like ocean here and the, and the blue marble and down the middle of that fjord. And the problem with EaseGrid is really kind of the underlying reason why these flight lines ended up being co-registered incorrectly with the blue marble, and that is that the projection ellipsoid is not 
the same as the reference datum that, was, that the data are registered to. And that particular problem is evidenced in um, issues like this where you can end up being, oh, 10 or 20 kilometers off in your geolocation because of this issue. The, if the software, if the user of the software knows enough about it, they can fix this problem. But what we wanted to do when we decided to define an EaseGrid 2.0 was fix this particular vexing issue so that people didn't have to deal with this problem again. So there are a couple of other uh, technical details that we did when we defined the EaseGrid 2.0. I'm not going to go into uh, great detail on these slides other than to say we changed a little bit with how the edge of the grid here interacts with the equator, and the, and the curvature of the equator is greatly exaggerated in this image. It's really just it's really just for illustration purposes. We had an issue that um, was caused by um, that basically resulted in some mapping software not really quite understanding exactly where the corners of the grid were, and so we set it up so that there's this little tiny sliver here that actually isn't covered in the EaseGrid 2.0 grids um, that, that solves that problem and makes it easier for users to use EaseGrid 2.0 data. The other thing that we did was at the pole, the original EaseGrid had the pole at the center of the center pixel, and uh, we shifted this. It was a little difficult for some, some to, to, to define that in some software packages, and so we basically changed it so that the pole was at the intersection of the center cell. That's, that may be more detailed than anybody is interested in, but if you are interested in that kind of detail, we do have a publication that I have listed here. The point for our project in using EaseGrid 2.0 was what I have circled on this long list of differences between the two definitions, and that is that, that projection ellipsoid and data mismatch that I mentioned on that first slide caused the original software or uh, the original EaseGrid data to require reprojection in order to get it into GeoTIFF. And GeoTIFF is recognized as uh, a real standard as far as uh, geolocation data and transferring data in images like what it is that we are, we are producing for this project. And so using EaseGrid 2.0 basically is supported in GeoTIFF format without any reprojection necessary. You don't need to know any details about the projection, um, about the, uh, yeah, the projection, um, and, and you don't have to reproject it in order to put it correctly into GeoTIFF. Most software will do the right thing with EaseGrid 2.0. So what that means is that tools like GDAL and ArcMap don't need any special help to interpret the images that we're producing for our project. They'll do the right thing to reproject it. And I like to include this list here just to show people that the EaseGrid 2.0 definition is being used by a number of uh, NASA and ESA projects that I've listed here, including uh, our, this is our CETB is the name of our project. We call it the Calibrated Enhanced Brightness Temperature. ESDR, I know it's a mouthful, um, but also we have also been funded to produce these, this same kind of imagery um, using the same techniques for the SMAP radiometer, um, and we'll be working on that in the next couple of years as a follow-on to this project. So I'm going to, as I proceed, I'm going to get into a little bit more and more technical details on things. In the past, I mentioned that the historical data were produced uh, in various different ways. It, it wasn't always consistent. Uh, one of the things that people had done in the past is they had divided the data into ascending and descending orbits, and they had done it using a break that's, that you can see in this little graphic down here. So if you're looking down at the pole, at the polar projection, and you see if the satellite would be traveling this way, the data that's collected would have been cut along this line right here from, um, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize, that it, it's ascending in this direction and then descending in that direction. Um, it was cut along this line that was curved here, and what that did was 
that ended up providing um, producing data that had been subsetted a little bit awkwardly. And uh, David and one of his students worked on showing that a better technique could be used that would actually cut the data along a straight line like this. And they coined the phrase local time of day. And so we, go, we went ahead and adopted this local time of day processing. I'll show you an example on this next slide. This is how, if you're looking again down at the pole here, you would see from the equator, this sort of circle around here, all the way up to the pole, you'd see the data with times that progress um, from the blue, deep blue, into light blue, and around to red along the course of a 24-hour period with, this, with these artifacts that happen up here at the high latitudes where there's lots of overlapping data. And it also, this is the historical way to divide it, produced this artifact over here and the pole hole and the descending passes that was a little bit awkward and not really terribly natural as far as the data that's all being binned into the same cell. So what the local time of day processing does is it produce, produces output that's much more consistently processed and is actually much more natural for uh, what it is that you're doing when you're working at high latitudes. So we went ahead and decided to use the local time of day processing. So in order to use the image reconstruction technique, we needed to be working on a data set that has the characteristics that these particular sensors exhibit. And that is, if you can look, if you can imagine, there's a lot of information on this slide here, but this ellipse that I'm tracing here is about a 40 by 60 kilometer area that is a footprint that is actually the integrated area that that measurement is uh, describing. So you get a brightness temperature that represents this big area, I mentioned that these data were pretty low resolution, and that's, that's, a, that's a huge area on the surface that you might be looking at. But the other characteristic that these sensors have is that they have a lot of oversampling. So the next ellipse next to it actually overlaps that first one in this area here. And all of these other ellipses basically show different sized footprints for the different frequencies that these sensors measure. But the idea that you get from, from this graphic is that there's a lot of oversampling, and so there's a lot more information in the image that you can extract by taking advantage of the fact that you have a lot of footprints that overlap that are actually measuring the same area on the surface. This next graphic I've included just to show that, for example, In the first circled graph here at the top, now instead of talking about the ellipses, I'm just talking about the center of the ellipses on a single pass that you see from this sensor. And you can see each one of these little dots here, 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 is just the repeating measurement that's going along in space and time. But down at the, in this bottom area here, when we have overlapping passes like we often get at the poles from these sensors, there's a much more irregular pattern of these, the, the centers of these footprints. And this overlapping pattern, together with the very large footprints that I talked about on the previous slide, make it so that we can use image reconstruction techniques and we can push the spatial resolution and increase it quite a bit. Our project compared two image reconstruction techniques to accomplish um, this goal. One of them is Bacchus Gilbert, uh, which has been around for a long time and is quite computationally expensive. And the second one is the radiometer version of the scatterometry image reconstruction algorithm that uh, David has developed and has uh, published. Both of these image reconstruction techniques can be tuned to either enhance the spatial resolution, so improve the spatial resolution, or to tamp down on the noise and to suppress the noise in the image, but they can't do both. Um, it's just a mathematical impossibility for them to do both. Both of the techniques require um, reasonable knowledge of that antenna pattern that I, that I represent in the, in, the, in the earlier graph by the ellipse. Um, it's basically what's, re what's referred to by electrical engineers as the measurement response function. And that's what's used to actually weight contributions of overlapping measurements. The advantage that our SIR gives us is that it can produce the qual qualitatively same information in the output images 
um, in a fraction of the computational time. It's uh, better than an order of magnitude faster than Bacchus Gilbert. So now I've just included this cartoon to just talk about this, you know, what, what does it really mean to be enhanced resolution? What, what have we really done with what's going on here? You're familiar with these ellipses that I use for the footprints. And if you can imagine in this left-hand cartoon, say these four ellipses are each contributing to the brightness temperature that we're going to calculate for this 25-kilometer pixel. Well, the lowest noise way to do that is actually to take those four measurements, add them together and divide by four, and come up with a drop in the bucket averaged value of what would have happened, what we think is the, is the brightness temperature at that location. What that does is it, it's the lowest noise answer to what is the surface, what was really happening at the surface that we've, that we've measured with those four overlapping pixels. If you move over into the image reconstruction side of this cartoon, we take those same measurements along with all the other measurements around them, and we overlay this grid here, this, which is, uh, in this case, I just rendered it as 8 by 8, approximately 3 kilometer pixel. And for each one of these pixels, like this one right here, you can see that there might be contributions from 2, 3, probably 4, uh, overlapping measurements, but they're happening at different places in the measurement. Some of them are closer to the center or closer to the edge of the ellipse. And so if we weight the values that we give them in the, in the output grid, then what we can do is, over here, we can produce an 8 by 8 a gri grid of higher resolution pixels that are each weighted by those overlapping pixels. That's a little, that's a little smarter way to actually find out what might have been occurring at a higher resolution, an enhanced resolution. So, so the next slide that I just wanted to include here is just to basically say that, and we've included uh, details of this in our publication, the exact, no, David has done uh, a fair bit of work to determine that the exact knowledge of that measurement response function is not actually required to do the image reconstruction that we're doing. We're using a reasonable approximation as a 2D Gaussian, two-dimensional Gaussian. And here's an example at several different uh, potential resolutions that that Gaussian might be weighted. And we were really pleased when we got these results. We did a bunch of comparison results and, um, and worked on synthetic data. It, it is a really good thing for our project that we were able to establish this because for some of the sensors that we're processing, the measurement response function is lost to history. We simply don't have it. Um, because the data are so old, we don't have access to the engineering notes and measurements that might have been done to measure that, that, that weighting function on those sensors. And so, so this was a very good result for us. We've published the engineering details of the work that we've done for this project in uh, TGARS. Uh, this article was published last May uh, for people who are interested in the engineering details of what it was that we did. The, the, the highlight of what we talk about in that article is actually uh, a fair bit of uh, work that David did using a synthetic truth image that I've included here to basically pass through that both Bacchus Gilbert and Sir, and to compare the results that we were seeing uh, with noisy and noise-free cases. And this is a figure from the paper that basically shows up here on the left that synthetic truth image that I just that I that I blew up on the last slide, and the results that we get from uh, the Sir technique and the Bacchus Gilbert technique which are effectively qualitatively similar, and like I said, there are details in the paper. Um, but the great advantage we get from SIR is that we, can get the, that we can get the answers in a fraction of the time. One of the main goals of the, of the NASA measures program is to produce data sets that are, uh, can be considered ESDRs, Earth Science Data Records, uh, which are also known as climate data records, and one of the characteristics of really good climate data records is that they have complete metadata that describes what it was that you did to produce the data, 
what the input data were that, that were used to produce the data, what were the algorithm parameter settings that you might have used to do the data so that you actually have a, a sort of um, an, an accountability um, in, the, in the data record that's stored right with the files that explains what it was that you did uh, for posterity when you might not be around to answer any questions about it. So what we did in our CETB data set is we chose the NetCDF4 format and the conventions that are known as climate forecaster conventions. We also use another set of conventions for the file level metadata called attribute conventions for data set discovery. I won't go into details on those. I'll talk a little more about the climate forecast conventions. But our basic approach in providing the most complete metadata that we could as our ESDR was produced was to use the EastGrid 2.0 projections so that software would do the right thing. I talked about that earlier. Um, to use climate forecaster metadata with coordinate variables uh, for our projected data so that tools would understand how the geo geolocation was stored in the file. Um, we also decided to encode the projection metadata in several ways in the file so that we would be as interoperable as we could with as many software packages as possible so that the, we included that information in several sort of flavors or formats for the geolocation. We included uh, five levels of um, data arrays in the files, including the brightness temperatures, which are kind of the money data part of the data, as well as some supporting variables that were derived as a byproduct of our processing. And then I would like to do a little shout out here for uh, the JPL Climate Forecaster Compliance Checker that we used. I've put a link here. If anyone out there is actually producing uh, CF, what they want to be CF compliant metadata, I would highly recommend this tool. It's very easy to use. It was very easy to understand what, what when we had a couple of violations in the, in the, in the uh, convention, it was easy to figure out what we needed to do to change it. And then all of that ended up leveraging the GeoTIFF standard so that we could get reliable geolocation in multiple tools. Multiple tools are able to understand our data. We did test the interoperability of our data set with a number of tools, including open source GDAL tools, which are command line level tools, to read the data and convert it with one command line to a GeoTIFF image, which then opens the door to uh, a number of other software packages like Envy or ArcMap, reading the GeoTIFFs right off the bat, no special processing needed, no special understanding on the user's part. This was really kind of a big goal that we had for our project so that we could minimize the, the work that people had to do to understand our data. We've also tested it with the IDV Panoply tool. And um, I'd also like to call out the NetCDF command line operators, NCO, uh, which can then be used, because we've used CF metadata, the NCO tools can be used to ge geographically subset and then concatenate in time so that users who are looking at time series of the data can do it really very, very easily with the NCO command line operators. So what does all of this technical detail get the user? What it gets the user is that with a GDAL command that can understand the metadata that we've enco encoded in the file, a user can produce a fully compliant GeoTIFF and then open it up. I've just done a little screen, screen dump here. Rather than doing a live demo, I just wanted to just show in users who are comfortable with ArcMap can then open up the data and without any special knowledge, the, the ArcMap understands the projection metadata that I've just pulled up here in one of their pop-up windows. It also means that without any special commands to ArcMap, it can reproject the data. So I'm just going to go back to here. So this is a whole a hemispheric view. You can see North America here, and here's the pole and the sea ice in the middle. And this is all interoperable with ArcMap commands that just reprojected these data so that users who are more familiar or who need to work in a different projection can do so quite easily. So now I get to the pretty picture part of the demonstration so that I can, I can show people, you know, you can, I can talk a lot about this data, but um, really pictures are worth a thousand words. What I've included here is on the left-hand side, 
the drop in the bucket, 25 kilometer images that are similar to the kinds of things that had been produced in the, in the past. And on the right hand side um, are the enhanced resolution images. Well, you have to kind of squint to see what's going on here, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to zoom into the area of uh, the Scandinavian Peninsula, and I'm going to zoom into that and show you what the differences are in these two images. Again, on the left, it's the low resolution, 25 kilometer drop in the bucket averages. You can see some detail here along the coast about what might have happened, but it's pretty pixelated because 25 kilometers is pretty coarse resolution. And on the right-hand side are the results that you get from running the enhanced resolution processing that we have that weights all those pixels and takes advantage of the overlapping measurements. And you see a great deal more detail about what's happening along coastlines, areas of big gradients of brightness temperatures where the brightness temperatures transition from being very cold to very warm. And then, for example, on lakes here and, and over here. and because of all this work that we've done with the metadata and the standards, you can simply overlay coastlines without having to do any fussing or any, any understanding a lot of technical details about the geolocation. Here's another example from South America, or uh, sorry, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I'm going to zoom into this area here that, that shows the um, southern tip of South America, including the Patagonian ice fields and uh, the Antarctic Peninsula here. I've lost my pointer. There we go. Here, Antarctic Peninsula, southern tip of South America. And in this example, I put the low noise 25 kilometer example on the top. And you can see You'll, you're getting the idea here. This is these are the pixelated ones. It's really kind of the the low resolution version of this of this image. And on the bottom, this is the enhancement that we've been able to achieve with the image reconstruction processing that we have done. So we're we're quite pleased with these results that um, and we think that it's going to open the door to people making some interesting observations about um, this using mining the rich information in this long data data record. I've included this one last slide to call out the work of Joan Ramage uh, that she presented last summer. She started using our data in uh, uh, an area of the high Arctic of Zevernaya Zemlya. Uh, it's an archipelago in the very high Arctic. And you can see the low resolution images here on the, on the left that zoomed into. It's a small island archipelago. I think there's, there's, there's several smaller islands, but there's about three islands here. And she's also overlaid the Glims glacier outlines on these, and she was able to do that quite easily. On the right-hand side, you can see what we got, the image enhancement that we were able to accomplish with that, with that same area. She's got some, Joan has some great results that's showing that um, the enhanced resolution data can, can be used to study melt onset on ice caps and ice sheets. Um, at, in, trend, in areas, small areas like this that uh, were really not possible with the original data. So in summary, um, our project status um, at this point in time, oh gosh, it says January and today's February already, um, is that we have produced our uh, peer-reviewed TGARS paper that describes the details of the image reconstruction that we did. We also have two white papers and an algorithm theoretical basis document, um, all in the, in the spirit of trying to be as accountable and as transparent to our user community as possible for what it was that we did and what decisions that we made and why we made them. We produced a prototype data set uh, for about 18 months worth of data that was reviewed by our early adopters. And I'm quite proud of some of the feedback that we got. One of our early adopters said that uh, they found our product to be one of the best products they've examined in terms of data set usability. So all that work that we did fussing with the metadata uh, paid off in my mind when I started getting comments like this from users. Our early adopters returned no clear preference for the two possible input data sets for SSMI, and so we went ahead and chose CSU for our final processing. Uh, we have finalized our data content and the metadata that we include, and the data can easily be reformatted to GeoTIFF. And um, 
the CF metadata also allows people using NCO tools to slice and dice the data however they need to do it in time and space uh, to work more easily with these data. The answer E data are complete and they are currently available from the NSIDC DAC. We have started processing the six SSMI sensors and uh, they will be available um, as soon as we uh, finish each one of them in turn. And the last thing, I didn't dwell on this, but for people who are Python users, we, we're producing a Python Conda package with uh, geolocation tools to go back and forth between row column and lat long uh, for, for people who need to do that uh, detail kind of work. And also a Jupyter notebook that has examples on how to actually read the data and metadata that people might find, users may find useful. And with that, on the last slide, I've included our data so there's the top URL here is the way to get to the data that's currently available at the DAC. The second one is our project web page, which has links to technical documentation and uh, project reports, including oh posters and presentations that we've done over the course of the project that may have graphics and detail that would be useful to people. And also I'd like to call out, I was really happy at the end of last year and late December uh, we had an EOS article that was accepted, and it was actually featured on the EOS Buzz email that people may get if they're if if they're subscribed to EOS um, the day before Christmas Eve. And uh, it's it's a nice top level article that describes the project and the goals that we had for the project. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Jennifer. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. Thanks, everybody. What we'll do now is we'll move to a final set of polling questions. And I will give these questions just a couple of minutes or so. Um, I did want to tell everybody that for question number six here, if you are providing your email address, the results are not being broadcast to all participants, OK? Just something to keep in mind if you're interested in receiving announcements from NSIDC about these data products. All right, so we'll give these a few minutes, and then what we'll do is we'll move to the Q&A portion of this webinar. And so be sure to stay in the virtual meeting space uh, to participate in the Q&A period. All right, thanks, everybody. All right, everybody, we're going to give this another 30 seconds or so, and then we'll move directly to the Q&A period. All right, everybody, let's move to the Q&A period. And I did want to say uh, just a couple of things really quickly first. 
I will be uploading, we, the, our speaker had a minor change to her slide deck, so I'll be uploading the presentation um, in just a moment. And then as you see here on the thank you slide, this webinar will be posted both to our online Adobe Connect catalog, which is the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar. There's also a link on that page for, you know, if you'd like to sign up to receive announcements for other data discovery and access webinars. Um, for example, our next webinar will be held next Wednesday and will feature uh, hydrology severe weather data products and tools from our NASA Global Hydrology Resource Center DAC in Huntsville, Alabama. And then um, at the end of February, we'll feature a webinar on SAR data, synthetic aperture radar data at our, one of our DACs in Fairbanks, Alaska. All right, so let's move to the Q&A period. Right now, I don't actually see any questions. If you have a question, what I'd like for you to do is type that into the Q&A pod located on the right-hand side of your screen. Anybody? Surely, we must have a question here. All right, great. Our first question is, will Lat Lawn great? Will lat lawn arrays be included in the net CDF file? Mary Jo? Uh, no, we decided uh, that that would blow up the data volume too much, um, but we are producing uh, corresponding latitude longitude arrays as separate net CDF files of their, on, their, on their own merit. Um, and we're in the process of uh, producing those and getting the DAC to, dis to, uh, to be distributing them. I'm actually in the process of doing that right now, so they will be available. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. Our next question is, how about AMSR2 data? Uh, presumably the, 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 um, the questioner is asking about whether we're going to be processing those data. Uh, I have applied for funding to do the same image reconstruction technique on AMSR2, but it has not yet been successful. I am still looking for uh, funding opportunities to do that. It would not be hard to do, especially since we've processed AMSR E and the formats are and the, the content and format are really quite similar. So we are actively seeking opportunities to do that. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. The next question is, when will 3.125 kilometer sea ice concentration be available? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't know. It depends on uh, the, the people who work on the sea ice algorithm, how quickly they, they, they pick up on the enhanced resolution data. I know that they are interested in using these brightness temperatures to derive sea ice at that resolution. Um, and honestly, we've only just uh, produced the first AMSR E the full time period just in December, and so they really haven't had enough time to uh, to work with that yet. But I know they are very interested in doing so. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. The next question is uh, great. Well, comment and question combined. Great presentation. My question is this: How can we use this product to identify melt refreezing events over snow in the Arctic? Um, I, there are several people who have worked with brightness temperatures uh, to do to look at onset of melt uh, events. Joan Ramage, whose work that I highlighted late in the presentation, uh, she has done it. Also, Marco Tedesco has done it, and they both have publications uh, for how the data can be how how the the melting signal can be extracted from the brightness temperature. So I would recommend that that you take a look at those papers for those techniques. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. The next question is, what is the range of the number of footprint observations that go into each grid cell? Um, it varies. It depends on the latitude of the observation because as you get closer to the pole, there's more overlapping swaths. It also depends on the actual uh, resolution, the, the target resolution, like the three kilometer or the six kilometer, how big those pixels are. It is one of the pieces of information that has never been available before that we've included in this data set. I mentioned that the brightness temperatures were the money array that was the, the, mo the most interesting bit of information that's included in the files. 
But another layer that we include in the files is the number of measurements that were used to derive the brightness temperature for that pixel. And that's included for every pixel in every image. And so you can see uh, if, you're, if you're very interested in understanding those patterns and how they change over space and time, um, you can actually extract it now with the, with the extra ancillary data that we've included in the files. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. The next question is, is this data suitable for thermal inertia estimation looking forward permafrost mapping? Uh, I, can't, I can't see that question. Could you repeat that, please? So the question is, is this data suitable for thermal inertia estimation looking forward permafrost mapping? Um, I'm a little bit unclear about the question. I can tell you that people have used brightness temperatures to estimate frozen ground areas. And um, I, I know I, I'm, the names of the authors are escaping me right now. Um, passive microwave is definitely sensitive to frozen ground. And so it's possible that the questioner may be able to get some more information about using passive microwave in that way. I'm not familiar with those algorithms or how they work. In this particular case, um, for S Sebastian, we can actually follow up offline as well. Um, yes, I'd be happy to. So, so we can, you know, perhaps flesh this question out a bit further offline. Thank you for your question. And the next question is, will there be a range of resolutions within each net CDF file or just a 25 kilometer and a RCR 3.125? Um, in any given file, there will only be one projection, and there are three, three possible projections, the northern azimuthal, the southern azimuthal, and the global cylindrical, um, and one resolution. So you'll get a file that has the low resolution, 25 kilometer, low noise drop in the bucket, and then you'll have a separate file that will be that same data process to the enhanced resolution grid. So they're all, they're all in separate files. Um, re it was really a file size issue that we had that we were working with the DAC so that the files didn't get too large. Even though we're using internal compression, these are almost global data at, ver at, at fairly high resolutions. And so we had to limit the data in some way. And that's the way we decided to break up the files. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. The next question is, what other metadata besides number of measurements are available per pixel? Um, so let me see. It's the average time of the measurements that were used to uh, derive that measurement, the standard deviation of the brightness temperatures that were used, and then the average incidence angle, um, which is sort of an orbital geometry that, that explains how the satellite and the the swath are interacting with the with the with the surface with the with the curved surface. All right, thank you, Mary Jo. Are there any additional questions? Give this a couple minutes here. And uh, if there are if we don't have a, any additional questions in the next few minutes or so, what I will do at that point is I will log off from the uh, audio component of this webinar. I will upload the presentations, both in PowerPoint format as well as uh, PDF. And I will leave the virtual meeting space open an additional you know, 10 to 15 minutes or so for those of you who are interested in downloading the presentation. Any additional questions from anybody? Yes. Okay. Jennifer, so it looks like question. Peter. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It looks like Peter has a follow-up. Yes. I yes. Can those metadata be used to determine an uncertainty? Um, I think for sure the number of measurements that went into the derivation could be used. I think that incidence angle will be most useful to people who want to take that into account when they're doing geophysical uh, derived algorithms. Um, standard deviation can absolutely be, can be, can be used to understand uh, whether there was a big gradient 
of data that were used to derive a, a given pixel. So yes, I think the short answer is yes. Okay, thank you, Mary Jo. Are there additional questions? I don't see any additional questions at this time. I'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Again, what we'll do is we'll log off from the audio, but we'll leave the virtual meeting space open. So certainly if you think of something, feel free to type that into the Q&A pod. And uh, during the last 10 or 15 minutes or so, I will be uploading uh, the two presentations, both in PDF and PowerPoint. And you can feel free to email me if you have any uh, questions about anything, and I can put you in contact with Mary Jo or the User Services Office at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. All right, everybody. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. And I hope that I will see you online at a future webinar. Looks like that might have been the last question today. All right, well, thank you to our speaker, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, at this particular point in time, with no further questions in the Q&A pod, we will log off from the audio portion, excuse me, of this webinar, and I will upload the files. So feel free to stick around in the virtual meeting space to download those files. But also know if you have a hard cutoff, you'll be able to download the files on the uh, Adobe Connect uh, online catalog, which is the tinyurl.com, Earth Data Webinar, um, all of our webinars since uh, May of 2013 are also posted there as well. Um, so you'll be able to, by click going through to the end of the presentation uh, on the uh, online catalog, you'll be able to download the files at a later date. It is a persistent feature by accessing the webinar in that way. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Mary Jo. All right, take care. Bye-bye now.